Welcome to the Invincible Innovation Show, the podcast for changemakers. Each week, I talk to the most fascinating entrepreneurs and innovation leaders about innovation, strategy, and design. Hey, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about the ultimate secret of branding. Welcome to Invincible Innovation Live Show. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm Adiva Zorkar, your product innovation and value creation expert, and I'll be your host. And today I have a very, very special guest, Kyle. Hi, Kyle. How are you, Adi? How are, it's a pleasure to be, to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so happy that you're here. Uh, Kyle Duport is Executive Creative Director at The Brand Leader, and I'm sure you're going to have a really, really interesting talk. Kyle is an Executive Creative Director who specializes in crafting outstanding advertising and branding for global brands looking to own winnable market shares. Yeah, now we can start. We're live on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook, and you're so invited to join the discussion and ask questions and join us. So before we start about the secrets of branding, how would you define a brand? I mean, that's such a loaded question, uh, yeah. but I think, it, I think it can be kind of simple, and that is... Um, we define a brand here as an emotional connection between a potential customer or a customer that you already have with a product, a brand, oh, sorry, a product, a business or a service. And if you think about it in those terms, it, it kind of makes a lot of sense because a brand doesn't really exist. A business exists, its employees exist, its services exist, its products exist, but there's not, a brand doesn't exist. It's kind of, it, you can't put your arms around it. You can't taste it, smell it. It's just, it's not a, it's so ethereal that, it's, it can only be boiled down to this kind of emotional connection. Like, how do you feel when you think about a brand? Uh, and so that's how we like to look at it. Yeah. So what makes a great brand? So, so give us a few examples other than, you know, we all know Nike and Apple. So give us like some examples that comes to your mind. Yeah. I mean, well, you just hit two big ones that people talk about, you know, a lot. Mm -hmm. If you think about, think about Nike for a minute. Um, I, I, well, let me, let me pause it. What makes a, a great brand is if you have people who uh, love it and uh, adhere to it and you, they can probably articulate what it means to them that probably fits some sort of definition that the business has itself about their mission or vision or values or some, something. So if you think about Nike and Nike, I, I know you're not here in the United States, but you know, you're an international star and you've got uh, all these people listening across the world. And if you think about um, Nike, and it, it, it means the same where you are in Israel as it does here in the United States. It means the same thing to Australians, to New Yorkers, to, you know, whatever. And it's because if, if you close your eyes and think about Nike, you know, it, it, you think about some aspirational images or athletes or healthy foods or uh, things that are going to make you better and perform better. And all those things that we think about when we think about Nike becomes the brand. And the fact that if I ask you the question, I ask my staff a question, if I ask somebody off the street the same question, we're all going to come, you know, within a certain, you know, realm of, you know, each other. It's going to be the same type of explanation. No one's going to say, um, oh, they, you know, they, they don't want people to achieve and no one's going to say they make cookies and nobody's, you know, it's not going to be that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. That's what makes the brand compelling. And uh, you talked about Apple and Apple is very similar. And you know, we talk about Starbucks a lot over here and, and Starbucks just because it's such a visible iconic brand these days that you can have the same drink in Dubai as you do in London and it's going to taste the same. Uh, they might name something slightly different for localization uh, perspective, but a latte is a latte is a latte and the aprons are the same color and the logo is the same and that adherence to the brand standards gives them an opportunity to have that conversation with their customers. And so when you see that logo, it means something to you. Um, and again, it, hopefully it means what they want you to feel and what, what you, they yeah. want it to mean. So it's, it's a fun thing to look at that, but those are some really, I mean, I don't know if they're great examples, but they're good examples to, ex to explain what a brand is. Now, when you talk to us on a smaller scale or maybe a business that maybe a business owner who's listening to this uh, wants to hear about the same principles apply you might not going to get that grand international scale, probably uh, not for many, many years, but the same ideas apply. Like, can you back up what you say? And uh, and ultimately, you want your customers to understand who you are from that same core. If you can do that, then you're successful. 
Yeah, but you know, when you said like everybody has a different like way of thinking about the brand, it might be very similar, but I guess that if, if we're taking a big brand that has lots of good products that people relate to, it, it, each one of these people would relate to a different product, I would say, and they would see it a bit differently, right? Because if I'm a teenager, maybe I would say something about, I don't know, Air Jordan and whatever. And if I'm a grown up, I would have something which is more related to, I know, to, to different points of view of, of Nike or I know that they, right now, for example, they have a, um, I think something in Netflix that they have all their um, exercises added to, to Netflix. Do you know that? Which is really, I, I really know. makes sense. Yeah, you should try. Out. Open your Netflix and open, and check it. So I'll they have all the exercises that they had, I think, on their website or something in order okay. to get to a bigger pro, uh, public, in order to, to get people exercising and attaching uh, well-being with their brand, I guess. Right. Well, you just said it right there, just attaching well-being. And then you can have that well-being across different touch points, but uh, uh, across different uh, ages, demographics, genders. It, it doesn't matter because a, a, a brand that's positioned in a proper way that has the right um, conveyance to its potential customers or current customers um, is going to hit, it's going to land on some, you know, facet of that. So it's, it's kind of like a Venn diagram. If you can imagine these, you know, circles that are overlapping and um, yeah. you might overlap on the side and have like, yes, it's performance and athleticism. And you might overlap on one side. It might be nutrition and well being, but you're going to have that core customer, which kind of has all of those in the center. And you, I think you accidentally stumbled on something, which is quite interesting. And that's, you mentioned Air Jordan. Air Jordan is a sub brand of Nike, right? So the Jordan right. brand is a, it's a so it 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 takes on some attributions of the parent brand, but in itself it also means something very different. Uh, I have a fourteen year old daughter. I've got I've got four daughters. Four of the six children are are girls. The middle wow. one. I is have four a, kids. Uh, yeah. Oh, so we're very similar. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she's a handful, but she loves Jordan. She loves the Jordan brand. She only wants to wear a Jordan. She plays basketball, the whole deal. If you, if I showed her like an, a typical uh, Nike, um, I don't know, like a, like a Dunk Low or, um, you know, an Air Max or something, she could care less. But if she saw like an Air Force One or an Air Jordan or something along those like more basketball urban shoes, like she's all in. Now, does that mean that one, the parent brand speaks differently than the sub brand? Well, yes and no. The core values are going to be the same. It's still going to inspire people. It's still to achieve greatness, but then it's going to be a little bit more tailored to that kind of sub audience. Um, and Jordan, in particular, it's clearly basketball. It's a little bit more urban than it is, um, you know, suburban. There's a couple other things that you can kind of attach to that. And so, it, it, it's one of those things where you have to be careful when when companies want to come up with extensions to their product line. And what the difference between an extension and a sub brand can be and what that could do to your brand, you know, because they also have skateboarding, they also have cycling, and then they have, you know, obviously the staples running football, soccer, those sorts of sports. So it, they all are governed by this kind of overarching brand position, statement, um, essence of the brand. But then they it, they attach their own little sub qualities to them. So uh, it's just an interesting distinction. But we're kind of going off topic, and I'm, I'm kind of yeah. want to do that sometimes. But I apologize. No, could you give me an example when there is an extension or a sub brand that is a mistake for the brand, and they made a mistake that they extended it to this type of audience or a product or a service? Well, yeah, I mean, um, I, I, that's a good question. Um, Top of my head, I can't think of one that was a massive mistake, but I think you can look at a lot of brands that have um, like big extensions like Coca-Cola products or Virgin. And you can see a lot of them sometimes will will close it down because it just wasn't the right thing for the customer or they sell it off because it was the right thing, but it wasn't right for the parent brand. So one doesn't come to mind specifically, but you know they're constantly coming up with products at Coke and some stick and some don't. And sometimes if they stick, um, it, it becomes very sticky. And sometimes if they don't, then they either spin it off or shut it down. Uh, yeah. If you look at Virgin, I'm thinking about Virgin and how it's like Virgin Galactic, Virgin Airlines, Virgin Atlantic, Virgin Mobile, Virgin Trains, Virgin Megastore, Virgin Books. 
if you look at bringing and I, I have to refresh myself a little bit on their on their core brand identity, but, but you know, it's basically bringing things to people that in a, in a mass way that they weren't otherwise accessible to. So, you know, mm -hmm. things like the Virgin Books and Virgin Music started very, very early on in Richard Branton's career because he wanted everyone to be have the opportunity to be um, part of something that might be exclusive. You know, you typically couldn't go into a, a record store. Uh, that had all these different types of music. And so he wanted to bring that to central London years ago. Uh, flying transatlantically was was very difficult. And so he wanted Virgin America to be able to do that and you know, Virgin Airlines in Europe and so forth. So, yeah. yes, they're, they're, they're good. Virgin Mobile was not everyone can afford a cell phone. Let's get people to afford a cell phone. So it's basically the, fir, vir, the name Virgin, one, it was uh, something people would talk about in the beginning, but also meant you're kind of like you have the ability to experience it first. So... It made yeah. sense. Imagine if he spun off, you know, version sports drinks, people would go, that's kind of weird. That's not really I in know. your. When I think yeah, about I mean, Richard Branson, like everything is, re is related to this specific entrepreneur that created everything there. And it seems that right. because he is very innovative and creative in his, the way he thought, it seems that everything he would touch more or less could be potentially successful. So I don't know. This is an example that yeah. I relate to this person and not to the brand itself. Well, that's very or true. And there's a, lot of done. there's a lot of things that he's done in particular that people follow. Um, and yeah, you're right. He has his, he's become his own brand in, in many right. ways. And then Virgin's become its own brand for certain. But remember that, you know, Virgin has a ton of different subsidies. I think they have a hundred different companies, all wow. named Virgin something. And then Richard Branson has his own, Richard is known for his books and his speaking engagements and his, you know, Necker Island and all these crazy things that he does, which has his own, you know, panache to it, not necessarily the brand anymore. So that's a, another perfect example that we've kind of stumbled into that brand can take different forms. You know, um, yeah. the brand necessarily isn't the person, the brand is what things have become. Once it becomes ownable by others, then it's no longer yours, you know, and so I'm, I'm sure... Richard's sitting around yeah. someplace and he's probably nothing like his persona that's become a, a brand of his. So yeah, anyway, for sure. go on that. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. In general, I think that uh, people perceive other like entities, it could be a company or a specific personal brand that, that they're thinking about. And it's it's really different than what people would think about. And, and totally. one thing that would come to my mind is like, how Facebook has changed and the way it's perceived in some of people. At the beginning, it was it it seems very different than what it seems right now. It's like mm -hmm. it, it, the, the brand grown, and now it's like a grown up. And now right. it's not like this cool kid that everybody's so enthusiastic about. They have expectations from this brand, I, I guess. So how do you see that when a, a brand is growing, growing up actually? What happens to the brand? Sometimes yeah. it, they're not relevant even sometimes. And that's right. I mean, I think relevancy is a big part of it. When, uh, especially with the social media and very and very um, digital forward companies, uh, and you know now Facebook is meta and all the properties they own, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's somewhat, somewhat on trend. And sometimes, you know, generationally, people then adopt something else. So if the next generation is picking up TikTok, for example, um, then you can see an adverse reaction to other things. Uh, but because they monetized Facebook fairly early on and they wanted to continue to grow, uh, you know, they're going to find ways to adapt. Or that's when you see brands either come up with a new product to compete or they buy a company like Facebook bought um, Instagram years ago. So yeah, uh, it is, it is, you're right. It's very difficult because trends change, um, appetite for things change. In this case, I mean, Again, we could probably splinter that conversation into a hundred other ones, but because of social media, there's so many things about social media that, whether it's privacy and data regulation and you know, and privacy concerns, it's, there's all that stuff that kind of attaches itself to those businesses. And you can have a bad brand perception, and it and a lot of you know my generation and my colleagues are getting off Facebook because it's it's not the thing that it was when we were in college, and so there's. Yeah, you can absolutely have those issues, but there's a lot of great ones too that kind of ebb and flow. Google, uh, Apple, uh, you mentioned Netflix earlier. You know, these are, yeah. I mean, look at Netflix went from competing against Blockbuster Video by sending 
literally DVDs in the mail to now being the premier uh, streaming company that has its own production studio. I mean, you never would have thought that, but because they're adapting to both the technology and the times and behavior, they're able to stay relevant. So, but if you think about, and, and I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but if you think about what Netflix core brand values are, it could be something like, I could imagine it'd be something like allowing entertainment to anyone at any time or something, which, which would fit the DVD model 20 years ago and fits the streaming model today. So yeah. those are the kind of things that when they, when they have, they meaning these bigger brands, when they have an opportunity to adjust and the adjustment is still underneath the, the guidance of the brand, then you can still work. And that's a perfect example of one that continues to work because their core value wasn't everyone should watch a DVD. It was probably, again, I don't know it offhand, but it was probably something like, you know, everyone should have access to entertainment or bring entertainment to the masses or something, which in the future, that could be, you know, a, a brain implant. If it still does it, okay, great. It still follows the brand. So, um, yeah. yeah. So what do you think is, like, we, 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 we talked about brands growing and changing. What do you think is the mm -hmm. secret of a brand that is, uh, has longevity and stays other than recreating themselves? Is it like that people It's are crazy. really attached to it? Uh, well, it's, it's simple. It's listen to your consumer. I mean, that's it. Um, at some point, the brand becomes too big for the company to hold on to. And it, it's, it's being owned by your customers. And it means something to them. You know, you know look at it. I'm not sure if, it, if the gap is over there. But when the gap here in the U.S., large you know, U.S. mall anchor store retailer uh, changed their logo, um, they didn't really listen to people. And it was a massive uproar. And, you know, I mean, it was insane. People were boycotting the gap and some things that are, were pretty silly. Because they changed the logo? Changed the logo. And they actually, and there's very few companies that would have done this, but they actually went back. They reverted it back to the old logo and they haven't changed it since. Wow. And it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, they didn't listen to the people. They were thinking the issues with, you know, their declining uh, mall store revenue and the, the proliferation of the internet, they thought, that they needed to change and adapt, but they changed the wrong thing. They didn't change yeah. their price points. They didn't change how they met their consumers. They changed the logo thinking that would be, become more modern. And it became the thing that people really got pissed off on. So it's really just about listening. Um, you know, should we go into this new vertical? Should we offer this new product line? And I'm not saying you, you know? have to, you know, offer that to everybody, but talk to your core yeah. audience. Do you, case studies and do like, you know, groups and, and uh, do some research and see, but it comes down to that one word is listen and see what you yeah. get back. You know what? That reminds me of, of the hedgehog of the Sonic, the Sonic hedgehog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That yeah. everybody hated him and then they need to change him because he was so ugly <laughs> and they changed the character afterwards. <laughs> yeah. So, but and, so but they, look, then spawned movies and apparel and all these things that, again, you just illustrated my point, and that's listen to your customers and give them what they want. And, uh, and you know, they're not always right because, you know, Steve Jobs famously said something to the effect of, you know, don't listen to the customer. They don't know what they want yet. But he's coming from an innovation standpoint. So, uh, you know, you have to kind of take that cautiously. But in general... Your customer knows more about your brand than you. They don't know the bottom line better than you. They, they don't know the product roadmap better than you. They might not know those things, but they probably won't. But they'll know the, the brand in a way that it's very difficult for somebody on the inside after time, once it takes hold, to, to, to speak on the same level of the brand that your customer would. Yeah, I know that, that uh, you're talking in many cases when you're thinking about yourself as a leader, a creative leader. And I want to hear what you're thinking about the topic that is in my mind all the time, which is generative AI and how would it influence creativity and in general, creative professionals. And, you know, we have Mid Journey and Open and AI and, and, and everything. So how do you think yeah. that would influence what we're seeing? I, 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 uh, right now, I think it's too, too young. You know, um, I've seen the open AI and I think it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, but it's still really rudimentary. So if you ask, I saw something recently, somebody said, um, I asked the AI machine to paint me a photo of, uh, or paint me a painting of, of a caveman taking a selfie. 
And it was just this really, it was really rudimentary. It was like, it did it, it understood it. But, but creativity doesn't come from a machine. It, it just, it fundamentally can't. And uh, I think you can get the building blocks from a machine, from artif artificial intelligence. I asked it to, to, uh, uh, to write me a story the other day. And it was very simple. It was, it was along the lines of a nursery rhyme where Jack and Jill went up the hill. And it, it's very yeah. simple. The, it might get there, but you're never going to have that human component for when, when things are creative. And so um, I think we were made that way. I think we were made to be creators. I think we were, um, uh, as humans, we have a unique ability that I don't think we'll ever be able to be mimicked. And that is to dream up, to imagine, to wonder. Uh, and by doing that, you that's where creativity lies. And I believe, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a believer that everyone is creative. I think that everyone in some right, and it doesn't need to be even like fine arts or, or even things like cooking or things that we think are kind of like artistic. I think how we express ourselves, how we speak to people, how how we are, how we are at work, how we are within relationships. I think we can be creative in those moments. And that's something that can just never be replicated by machines. And if it does happen in my lifetime, I think I'll be scared to death because one, I'll be out of a job. <laughs> but two, you know, I've seen enough Terminator movies to know that doesn't end well. Yeah. You remember I the mean, Spielberg movie AI, like, I don't know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I know when, when yeah. it was. It was such a scary movie. It was yeah. with robots, but still it was really scary. So I want to go and drill into the, your you as a creative director. And I want to read a quote, that, a quote that I read, that you pride yourself on growing people first and building high-performing team based on trust and vulnerability. So the, the last word is usually not used within the context of leadership. So yeah. how do you see leadership, business leadership, and how do you think that vulnerability is important and essential to it? I mean, that's a, that's a big shift going from AI to, to human vulnerability. No, I, but... it's going from branding to leadership. And then I say, okay, I have another, another question related to leadership. So it's not related to AI, of course. Um. Yeah, I mean, I just believe in general that, um, and, and this kind of goes back to what we were just talking about, ironically, and that's just being humans. And I, I firmly believe that uh, we we deeply desire human to human connection, and I think there's a there's an innate drive for us to to be with people and to enjoy uh, company, to enjoy groups, to enjoy tribes, if you will. I think it it absolutely fuels the idea of brand, and, and which I think is probably one of the reasons I'm in this this um this industry but as a leader and listen i've made i'm almost 50 years old i've made a lot of mistakes in my life and um the bulk of my career 44 45 years or so was was leading the wrong way was thinking um typical corporate america you had to rule with an iron fist you fire people on a dime you treat people who are below you as uh, as you know not equals and um, I saw how that not only affected other people's lives and and uh, and and tore people down rather than building them up, but it was selfish and there was ways that you just you just don't feel good at the end of the day. And you know if I if I told you you know wake up tomorrow and spend the entire day doing everything for yourself, don't open doors for people, don't help people, just be incredibly selfish, and then take note of the feeling you have when you put your head in your pillow at night, and then the next day do the complete opposite. And just serve others and just be kind to people and offer yourself and spend time and hold the door open and buy a coffee and listen. At that night, as you put your head down on your pillow, I bet you'd feel differently. And I think that's how we're meant to live our life. And so I missed the memo on that, unfortunately, for the bulk of my life. And and so I've been given an incredible, I was going to say second chance, but it's been like a 10th chance to to now run a business where I have a unique ability to not just be vulnerable, but to be open. And I, and I don't always do it well, and I don't always do it right, and I don't always do it. But I can tell you that I'm in incredibly vulnerable with, I struggle with mental health issues and anxiety and depression, very open about that. I'm very open about my Christian faith, but I'm also very open for anyone else and what their faith is and what their proclivities are and what they enjoy. And everyone, my wife and I say that everyone's welcome at our table. And, and that's true. And I like to run the business that way as well. I've got an incredible uh, owner here who, who owns the business, who allows us to be that way, who allows us to open up ourselves to others 
Um, and it's just changed the game for us, for me personally, but also for everyone. So um, letting people cry in my office and letting them see me in a weakened moment, not to say that being cry crying is weak, but when you're feeling vulnerable and letting people see your emotions and, and riding that with somebody else is uh, that I think that's the secret of life. And so if we can do that and live together in that space where we can trust one another, uh, then um, then it just becomes a really magical moment. So it gets a little hokey sometimes talking about it because you kind of have to experience <laughs> it to know what I'm talking about. But it's what led us to to earn five best places to work awards in the last two years. It's because we have a lot of people who feel welcome, who feel uh, loved and trusted, uh, and that they're also um, valued. And I don't think you can do that without uh, – without a certain level of vulnerability yourself, you know? So yeah. that's kind of how I see the world. Yeah, I totally agree. And I totally understand what you're saying. And I believe that in order to really be creative and innovative, you need trust and you need the ability to try new things and to try things that are, you've never done, especially in, yep. in the business of being creative. Because when you're being creative, it's, it's very open-minded if you want to do it right. And if you're, yeah. if somebody is very strict with you and tells you exactly what you do and, and really goes and, and see what you're doing all the time, you know, from, from behind and watching you all the time and, and it's stressed, I don't think people can really be creative and really create things which are exceptional in, in that sense. And it's not only in creativity, well, but for sure in creativity and innovation, this is what, need, what is yeah. needed. Well, it, it's, you, and you're right, it's, it's especially there because it, it is, uh, for a true artist, it can be a very vulnerable thing to put yourself on a canvas, to write something very poignant. Uh, you know, but you're also, if you write from a position of vulnerability, you're not really wrong. So no one looked at Rembrandt or Picasso and said, well, that painting is wrong. You can say that it might not be technically correct or it might not follow a certain mold, but if you've done it with passion and integrity and, and love, uh, it can't be wrong. And so, it, yeah, it's, it's, it, in, that, in that sense, it's very difficult because working with a bunch of creatives here, writers and designers and so forth, illustrators, um, you know, you might know what's better for the client one direction or another, but the work itself isn't necessarily wrong. It's not, I mean, if, if you do it from that spirit. And so um, my job is just to pull it out of people and make sure that they're doing their best work all the time um, but from that spirit of integrity and um, and and vulnerability. So in, in that sense, it becomes very enjoyable, very fun. Yeah, for sure. I think it, it, when you're coming to a place that people really know you, for, for one thing, you feel that you're part of this, I would say, a small tribe that you're working with a, each day. It doesn't matter if you meet them if, or it's online for that sake. You feel that you could be yourself. And when you're talking about something which is so creative as branding, because you need to think differently, you cannot do the same solution to all the brands that you're working with. You need to be exceptional. Right. You need to think right. differently, especially if you want to create something which is um, that would catch the heart of people. Today, we have so many brands and products in, South, in, like in front of us. It's so hard to create that. So how do you create something like that if you're yourself so stressed? And I know that in many creative, like in advertising agencies, you have people who are really stressed out. They're working really, really fast and intention, intention. What, what do you think? Do you think it's, there is a con connection between the results and the way that they are feeling these professionals? Oh, a hundred percent. And, um, we try to get everyone out of here by 5.30 every day. And we offer bonuses here to people like unlimited vacation and mental health uh, you know, days. And it, it, we try to create an environment where it's very, um, well, put it this way. You actually just said the word stress. I don't believe you can create in that environment. So yes, there are stressful times. I'm not going to lie. There's deadlines and you have to adhere to them. Of course. And there's, you know, there's, otherwise you can't earn the money and pay the people and to do those things. But sure. we try to balance as best we can. It's not always easy. And sometimes that's actually the most difficult part of my job is balancing the kindness and the um, openness and that kind of spirit with 
but this is a business and we have to do good work. And so it's a, it's a hard line to, to, to kind of follow, but uh, yeah, there's advertising agencies that go out there and, and tell people you need to work until 10 PM or it's until it's done. And you, you start building this feeling of resentment and, and you built this ladder where it's like, Oh, well, this was happened to me. So I have to do it to my staff. And then when I get up into the next level, I'm going to do it to the person who was in my, and it's just this ongoing never ending cycle. And so we tried to break that and say, no, we're going to do things a little bit differently. And I believe that's where we're able to be more creative because we have that opportunity to invest in the right things and the right time and, and also the right people. And again, it's not, it doesn't always work. I mean, it's again, because you are a business and you have deadlines, sometimes you get a little bit overloaded, but for the most part, we try to make sure that um, if you have a clear head, if you're, if you're physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually uh, in a good place, you're naturally going to be able to do great things. And, uh, and so that's kind of how we try to, to do it. And hopefully in that greatness, we're helping those brands. Um, and we're also helping our own people see their own value and what they're able to contribute. Yeah. And I think that it's like, it's like two sides. First, you have better results from people and they're more involved and they want to be part and, and to contribute and their performance might be better. And on the other side, you as a, as a business um, leader or owner, even you're feeling that you're doing something which is right for you and then it's right for the people that work with you. So you feel that you are in a better position yeah. and not being that uh, tough. And as you said, like it, looking at the bottom line all the time, like looking all the time about like the numbers are everything for me. I mean, you hit it on the head. I, mean, I think that's exactly it. Yeah. That's exactly Which it. Sometimes this is what you see when people are talking in leadership, they're talking about these like skills to manage uh, the money, to manage the business, which is equals the numbers. But actually, as I see when people understand leadership, they would see the soft skills and the human part of it being much more important, especially in these days, I guess, when I feel that employees are thinking about what is the best place to, especially young ones to invest my time and efforts and talents and where do I want to stay? Right. Well, I, um, I think there's a big difference between being a manager and a leader. And, uh, I'm a, I believe I'm an awful manager and I tend to think that I'm a, I'm a better leader. Um, and I, and I think that I will, I would always say that if I had to, I could probably get everybody in the building to march up to the roof and jump off one at a time. And I could do that through charisma and through passion and through, you know, loyalty that we've created and just have people trust me and they trust me because I, I do what I say I'm going to do and I show them my vulnerability. But now if you ask me how to get them on the roof and which order in which to jump and how to organize everybody, that's management. That I don't know how to do. And I trust a lot of other people to help me do that work or to do the work for us. Uh, and there are some things that you just talked about, numbers and things like that, which are important for a leader to understand. But that's not necessarily my skill. And I think you're right. I think there's a, a certain level of a soft skill that is needed to both understand how to push people at the right times and also how to understand when they need you to, to invest in them. And that balance is kind of like what I talked about earlier is the balance of kind of the kindness and and also in uh, in running a business. And I think in general, we try to do it in a way that um, I look at things that go at the end of the day, our work isn't important. It's important to our clients. It's important to what they're doing for their life and for their livelihood. And for that reason, it should be important to us. But at the end of the day, it's not really, we're not saving lives. We're not curing cancer. We're, we're, we're doing really fun advertising work and that should be fun. There should be a levity to that, which is, which, you know, like we're incredibly blessed to be able to do this kind of work and that we're not, you know, shoveling a barn out or, you know, paving streets or something. And, and, uh, I don't look down that work, but I think I'm very fortunate to not have to do that work to earn a living. And I think we need to keep that in, in, in our minds that we're incredibly blessed to, to have the skills we have to, to live in this world, to live in this industry, but also to be able to do that and to, to make other people's dreams come true. So that's really the magic is really, if you can understand that, uh, we had two, two, we have two people start today. One person's a copywriter and one person's a project manager. And we have 36 people at the office, including them. And one of them is highly creative and one of them enables us to be creative, if that makes sense. And that's the, that's yeah. the fun part. 
Um, because yeah. if you don't have the people that organize your time to organize what's, I mean, there's a skill there that I do not have. Um, and those project management skills are so important. Um, but to say that, in con just basically in contrast, uh, to highlight the differences, you need both. You need to have that tension. Otherwise, a copywriter without direction is just somebody writing words down. If you have a project manager who has no one to manage or no one, no projects in which to manage, you know, they're just sitting waiting for something to happen. So you need both. You yeah. need need this tension constantly in life to kind of help you, you know, find your way. Yeah. I really love the fact that you're saying that it needs to be fun because I really believe that people sometimes forget that most of their time when they're awake, they're at work. And yeah. if you are not enjoying what you're doing and not having fun, not all day, but sometimes you really enjoy what you're doing, mm -hmm. I, I just just imagine wasting your like more, most precious time, just doing yeah. something because you need to, because you have to. And it's so important that, that you see it as, as someone who's working with people and not just thinking about the, the, the results. Let's say it's this way. So could you tell us like a story about a brand? What? I'm sorry. I was just going to really end one that real quick. And that was just to say that you have to enjoy the people you're working with too, not just the work. Yeah. Doing. And so I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. I totally agree. By the way, I had a talk like my last talk and we talked about the fact that most people leave their job, not because of the salary, not because if they, if they get a vacation or not. It's because they don't like, most of the time, they're managers. It's like too hard for them to yeah. manage each day someone who they don't like to work with. And, and it's so right. important that you, you choose people who could and love to work with people, which most people, when you're thinking, when they get to leadership, it's because they're so good in their profession. You're a good lawyer. You have like a team of, of people working for you. And you're a good, uh, right. I know, designer. You have designers and a team leader for, for design, whatever. But it doesn't mean that you're good with people. You're good at what you're doing, right? And, right. and, and that's, and that's, that's a problem. Cool that I didn't have most of my life where I, I conflated the two. I thought, I thought they were mutually exclusive and they're not. And it's really, um, and I, and like I said, I'm, I'm still a work in progress, so I'm still learning these things. But I think in general- Everyone is. Yeah, well, true. Um, <laughs> if you can understand the people in which you work with, And, you know, there has to be some sort of like, you can't, I don't believe you can be, a, and this is where the tension is again, right? The, but you can't, I don't believe you can be effective if you get so close that then, you know, you can't spring on somebody, hey, you're fired after, you know, having them and their spouse over to have dinner with your family. You know, you have to be pragmatic. You have to have a little bit of a space there so you can have those tough decisions when they happen. But, you know, I've been lucky to never have to fire anyone here. Uh, wow. People have left on their own accord. Uh, twice, I think, in a number of years, we've had people who struggled, um, and they both turned it around. One person ended up deciding it wasn't the career for them, changed their career entirely. But I believe once you're in the door, you're, you're my responsibility. And, and then I'm going to work, you know, I'm going to do my work ahead of time to make sure we bring the right people in. But once you're in, you're in, you're part of the family, and I will work as hard as I can to help you achieve your own goals. And part of that is that's where that trust starts to begin and um but again you need a little bit of separation so i can probably tell you something personal about everybody in the office which i i, I pride myself on and, and i love every one of them dearly um but while i can while i can understand who they are and where they are at in life you know to a point to a point that they're willing to invest back to us um i still have to understand that this is a business and so we have to have that tough thing so it's is that's the challenge of a leader is to understand when's the right time to build somebody up when's the right time to rebuke softly and in private when's when do you exalt people in in a crowd and when do you have smaller groups to to challenge each other and to have those hard conversations um and that's really the that's really the key is understanding yeah. how to do all that stuff and I, I'm, i'm learning it but i'm trying Yeah, that's good. You know, we are learning and trying to be better all the time. And we, we all need to make decisions upon what we know at that time and to make the decision. So, um, like, self-compassion is important in any case. So I want yeah. you to give me an example of a brand that you worked with, you worked with. And maybe you could tell me, how do you see this point of view of working with human for humans change the way that you're doing your work? 
Wow, that's a, a big question. Um, uh, well, I can tell you, there's one that comes to mind, and that's um, one called In Good Taste, and it's a wine company. Um, but I'll use that as an example um, as a larger, uh, as kind of a, I'll use it as a microcosm of explaining this. Um, we start all brands uh, at the beginning, either a rebrand or a new, a new brand, a brand creation from a point of view of an archetype. And if you're familiar with Carl Jung and his uh, Jungian archetype, now we call them Jungian, he didn't call them that, but uh, there's 12. Uh, basically, they're not really personality traits, but they're kind of a way that we see the world. And uh, you know, you, you'd probably be familiar with them or your listeners might be things like the hero, the outlaw, uh, the romantic or the lover, uh, you know, the everyman, the creator, the magician. Those, and there's 12 of them. And he said that everyone kind of adheres mostly to one of these. And, and you might change through your lifetime, but for the most part, you're one of these 12. Somewhere uh, along the line in the 90s, a couple of researchers said, well, if brands are kind of an emotional connection and brands are not really businesses but they're more like people and they act and behave that way and they have personality traits then we should be able to map an archetype to them as well and this kind of like new era of branding kind of occurred and it's something we we do really well not everyone does it in in the brand world and advertising world but we do and what we found is that if you can really understand the um the purpose and the drive and from where it comes from from a brand and map an archetype to it and we actually go down to a sub archetype there's usually four or five of each major one if you're talking about like 50 or so potential possibilities of where this brand's kind of core direction comes from then you've got something really special so in this case of in good taste uh it was a wine company an at-home uh business consumer wine uh, maker that sent uh, what they would call mini moments of uh, to have a moment at home. It's basically like a glass and a half of wine, these little mini bottles. So we rebranded them and everything, but we looked at the, who they are, what they were trying to accomplish. And if and we went back to Netflix and asked what their core values were and what they were trying to accomplish, their purpose for these guys, we call them IGT for short, but for, for them, their whole idea was we want people to experience wine in a very, uh, in a very open welcoming way when take the barrier down there's a there's a lot of stigma associated with wine that you have to be have a lot of money or know a lot about it and they wanted to eradicate those kind of stigmas and, and allow people to approach it and we said okay well, we think that's kind of like a companion-ish kind of thing and maybe the lover brand the lover brand archetype with a companion sub archetype basically the idea of can you saddle up next to somebody and say listen let me use my experience to help teach you not in a sage way, a sage archetype way, which is more educational and more like from a, a point of view of knowledge, but this is from an experience point of view. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come next to my best friend. I'm gonna come next to my family member. I'm gonna say, hey, I like wine. I, I think you might enjoy what I like, or you're interested in wine. I happen to know about it. Come, let's do this together. That changed everything for us, for them, because we're able to then say, okay, well then you're gonna speak this way. Your colors are probably gonna be these types of colors your font selection, your typography is probably going to be in this lane, this line of thinking. So then what you have at the end is this kind of collection of ideas stemming from your core personality trait, your core archetype, which then you can start building around that. And what happened to them was it changed how they speak to people. Their voice and tone documents changed. We, we rewrote everything. They avoided certain words. They talked in a certain way. And if you can think about how you speak to people, you can speak energetically or enthusiastically or derogatorily, or you can speak, you know, sarcastically. There's so many different ways, character traits uh, uh, mapped to a voice and tone document. And we said, we're going to take this lane because this is what a companion would do. This is how they would speak. So their emails are written that way, subject lines, business cards, website, product naming, everything comes from that. And when you're able to do that, and it is a vulnerable process as well because you're asking a company to strip down their all the you know stuff around them to get down to the core and say, okay, why did you start this company? What do you hope to achieve? What's your future purpose? What's your mission as a business? And you get through all that stuff, and you can boil away all that extra, and you find the meat of it. Then you can go, wow, that's that's powerful. And then you do that brand exercise that we do, which we do very well. You come out the other end with something where you map your purpose, 
to a way you speak to people or the way you see the world. And then you wrap all of that in the aesthetics and the design, the, the creative, if you will. Uh, and then you create something which is untouchable. And you were kind enough in the in the intro to to say that we we kind of find open spots in the in the marketplace, open gaps in the marketplace, and it's ownable. We can own that. If you can do that well, what would I just outline for the IGT company? Then no one can touch you. You've owned this space. No one's going to come in and speak the same way as you because you're already there doing it. There might take another tack, a mother, another archetype. And you see this all the time. You see brands that come in trying to do what the other brand's doing. They will always fail. But if they come in with a separate point of view, where they see the world from a different angle, they, they talk in a different way, they're not only going to attract a different user, but they're not going to compete solely on the product might compete. Coke and Pepsi might compete on a product level, but how they speak to their consumers is fundamentally different. And if you can own that separate space, then you can own uh, you can own that share of the market, and that's really great. So it's kind of this long red thread that goes from the origin of the brand, the origin of the company, all the way through talking to a consumer or a customer. And at that point, if you can do it well, and you can adhere to the brand, and that's very important, you adhere to the brand. That's why we have brand standards, brand guidelines, to make sure you don't deviate for how you speak. Then you have an opportunity uh, to win. That's where yeah. it, it becomes. Really, really fun for us. Yeah, I love it that we talked about being human from the beginning and what is branding, how do you do business, and how do you do the work process. And it's all related to the fact that even the brand is an archetype of a person, a type, a yep. type and subtype. And the way that you communicate is like a person to the end customer, which is a person. And you communicate in visuals, in, create, in creative ways, but you still do create communication and in the end if it works you could relate to it you have this emotional connection to to this brand it's like closing what we talked about from the beginning till now right yeah. exactly yeah exactly and that is ultimately where it's not only fun but magical so it's fun for us to do we own it ourselves because there's not many folks who do exactly how we do it it's fun for the brand but it's also effective And they actually can advance their position in the marketplace because of the work we do. So you're really tying in all the best things of life. You know, you're helping people. You're doing it with other people you really care about. You're having a fun experience, but you're doing it well in a, in a way that you can help people achieve their goals. And that's just really fun. Wow. Sounds really fun. Maybe I'll come to work with you next time. <laughs> so <welcome>. tell me. <laughs> sure. So where could people hear more about what you're doing and contact you? Yeah, uh, we're able to be found at thebrandleader.com and you can just search for the brand leader or go to thebrandleader.com. You can see our work there. You can see a little bit of our process and how we do things. You can see all of our amazing staff uh, and you can also just send us a note if you want to. Thank you, Kai. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's lots of fun. And I really love the fact that we didn't talk about only like technical, educational stuff, but things that are related to the heart. So thank you. And to My all of you pleasure. change makers, thank you. And to all of you change makers out there, thank you for joining me. And if you want to learn more about what I do, go to invincibleinnovation.com and I'll see you next week with about another innovative, insightful talk. See ya. Yay. I'm Adima Zaukario, and you've been listening to the Invincible Innovation Podcast. Make sure to visit our website, invincibleinnovation.com where you can learn more about our programs and my book, Innovating Through Chaos. I'll be waiting for you next week in our next episode. Thank you for listening.